two previous Nobel lectures has been arranged earlier in the year, starting from Professor David Gross in January this year and Professor Aaron Chishinawa in April. Today, we are really delighted to have a truly special guest, Professor Roger Kornberg, the 2006 Nobel laureate in chemistry. This famous British lecture series is co-organized by the International Peace Foundation. Now the time has come to begin the event. As a host, I would like to invite Professor Sakon Mokonsuk, the Dean of the Faculty of Science, Mahidon University, to kindly come forward for a welcoming address to all of us. Please, Professor Sakon, turn up. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, General Sir Yud Suranon, the Privy Council, esteemed guests, Professor Roger Kornberg, the Nobel Laureate, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you to the Nobel Lecture Series at the Faculty of Science, Mehidon University. Today's special lecture by Professor Roger Kornberg the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry is a landmark event at the Faculty of Science, Mehidon University. I am delighted to see many distinguished guests joining us today, today in this remarkable occasion. Apart from the comprehensive teaching and research activities to create a body of knowledge and innovations beneficial to society, one of the academic missions of the Faculty of Science, Mahidon University, over the past five decades is to fostering development of scientific cooperation between the faculty and the international partners. One of these cooperative activities, Faculty of Science, Mahidon University, has joined with the International Peace Foundation to co-organize the British Dialogue Towards a Culture of Peace event series, where a number of Nobel laureates delivered lectures in many fields have been organized since 2004. Especially this year, which is the year of our celebration to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Faculty of Science, Mahidon University, three events of Nobel laureate lectures were organized. Today, we are honored to welcome a distinguished guest lecturer, Professor Roger Kornberg, the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. Professor Kornberg received the Nobel Prize for his studies in the molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription, the landmark discovery from the fundamental to our understanding of gene expressions, which is the basis of unraveling complex processes in health and in pathological conditions. I do strongly believe that Professor Kornberg's special lecture today on the topic of science as a basis for bridging between cultures and fostering peace and development is an important step in our efforts to encourage international scientific interactions, particularly with young scientists and students. I would like to take this opportunity to show our appreciations to many persons and organizations for their support, especially, especially to General Surayut Juranon, who will deliver the opening remarks of this special lecture event, and to the International Peace Foundation and its chairman, Dr. Uwe Morawitz, whose firm commitment to, the, to organize bridges dialogues toward a culture of peace has guarantee the realization of the event. We would like to acknowledge the contributions of Thai Airways, Toyota, and Lusitani Hotel Companies for their valuable contributions. I would like to also thank staff of Mahidon University who helped organize this event. And we are grateful to Professor Kornberg. Your presence here today is a strong encouragement for Unlimited Frontier of Science Network and make this event so fruitful. So I would like to conclude by wishing you all a fruitful and productive participation in this Nobel Laureate Lecture. Thank you.
Panatan Pon Ek Suryut Chulanond. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, so what cup and welcome to the second ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the page, common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. And I would like to thank the Faculty of Science at Maidon University and its Dean, Professor Skorn Mongolsuk, for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2008, Bridges is being continuously held in Thailand and Malaysia until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The second ASEAN series of bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 300 bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand and in the Philippines since 2003. Bridges has been established as an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education for all people. The International Peace Foundation has no concept for peace and no fixed solution how to achieve peace, but we, we believe that the first step towards peace is dialogue, and the first step towards dialogue is respect. The International Peace Foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet. People from all walks of life. People who speak different languages, even if they speak the same. As politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders, another one than scientists, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answers and solutions, how to, achieve, how to solve problems, how to achieve peace, though the quest for peace lies in the art to pose the right questions. The International Peace Foundation believes that the interconnected problems of our world today cannot be solved only by politicians, only by business, only by scientists, or by religion alone, but by working together. In the Bridges event series, people from all walks of life meet in a multidisciplinary program to find creative solutions to solve problems and to achieve peace. Peace within ourselves, within our family, within social structures, peace with nature and the environment, peace between nations, cultures, and religions. Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as one single conference, but as a series of events over the period of six months in which Nobel laureates from all fields build bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few but which needs the participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet, can international understanding be achieved and problems commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways, and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. May I now invite you to listen to and to share your views with Professor Roger Kornberg, the 2006 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, who has agreed to come to Thailand to help build bridges. We look forward to his keynote speech and to his very important contribution. Kop Kun Kap. Professor Roger David Kornberg, Dean Skorn, Mongkhon Suk, Chairman of International Peace Foundation, and distinguished guests. 
It is truly my pleasure and honor to be here and have the opportunity to make an opening remark on occasion of bridges dialogues towards a culture of peace event series, which is the third one of year 2008 that International Peace Foundation co-organizes with Faculty of Science, Maidon University. Through the lecture series of Bridges Dialogues event, today we have a remarkable opportunity to welcome our guest of honor, Professor Rush David Kornberg, the Professor of Structural Biology at Stanford University School of Medicine. Professor Kornberg was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2006 for his studies of the molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription, which also helped explain how disease can result when transcription go awry and offer the potential for unlocking new therapeutic approaches. Today, he will deliver a special lecture on the topic science as basis for reaching between cultures and fostering peace and development. As we are all well aware, today's world is unfortunately filled with so many conflicts. Many parts of the globe have battles between ethnic groups, faiths, and other differences, while fights against hungers, disease, and deterioration of the global environment are still far from over. Therefore, today's topic is genuinely relevant and timely, helping us understand how science could play a crucial role in promoting peace and understanding. May I take this opportunity to express my sincere thank to the International Peace Foundation and Faculty of Science, Mahidon University, for co-hosting this event and wish you all the best for a fruitful and enlightened presentation. At this point, I now declare to open this special event series of British Dialogues, a culture of peace with the special lecture in the topic of science as a basis for bridging between cultures and fostering peace and development by Professor Roger Kornberg. Thank you very much. Before we begin, let me allow me to Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his study of the molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription. All of us know him very well from the textbook, and it's such a wonderful opportunity to meet him in person today. Professor Kornberg earned his bachelor degree from Harvard University in 1967, and his PhD in chemical physics from Stanford University in 1972. He then moved to MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, United Kingdom, with Professor Alan Klug, a 1982 Nobel laureate in chemistry to work on protein crystallography and nucleosomes. In 1978, he joined the Department of Structural Biology of Stanford Medical School to focus on the mechanism and regulation of eukaryotic gene expression. It took half a quarter of a century for his research effort that contributed to several fundamental discoveries concerning the mechanisms and regulation of eukaryotic transcription. The work explained the process by which genetic information from DNA is copied to messenger RNA, catalyzed by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. His effort to elucidate the structure of the RNA polymerase at atomic detail, the holy grail structure of in structural biology. This most complex protein structure of RNA polymerase review a clear picture as um, 
emphasized by the Nobel Committee to show how transcription works at a molecular level. Interestingly, at the age of 12, in 1959, Professor Roger Kornberg attended a Nobel Prize ceremony for his father, a very famous Professor Arthur Kornberg. He then returned to Stockholm for the seven years later to receive his own prize. For today's event, Professor Kornberg will speak to us on a topic of basic science, the hope of progress, and the time, the, now the time has come. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a warm welcome, Professor Kornberg. Very special guest today. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, to the Dean and the University, to all who have made this possible, to the International Peace Foundation and Mr. Morowitz. I'm most grateful uh, for the opportunity of speaking to you this afternoon. Uh, you see here an abbreviated form of the longer title, and you'll understand why I summarize it in this way as we go along. Uh, I will indeed address the topic uh, given in the uh, lengthier version, but with a summary statement um, that is presented on this slide. Some of you who have attended previous uh, Bridges presentations uh, may have heard or read uh, a commentary uh, <clears throat> by the participant, uh, a physicist, uh, Professor Sheldon Glashow. Sheldon Glashow commented in his contribution to Bridges on the importance of basic science and of serendipity, of chance discovery for technological development and the benefit of mankind. He gave examples from his own subject, from physical science, and he told about their impact on engineering. I myself have made similar arguments in the past in relation to biomedical science rather than physical science, and I've commented on its impact on human health. And I'd like to begin today with biomedical science and then continue the discussion that was begun by Professor Glashow along several lines which will include the following. First, the underlying reason and the indispensable nature of truly basic research. Then the meaning and the mechanism of what Professor Glashow referred to as serendipity, that is to say chance discovery in basic research. I'll comment on the relationship of basic science to industry, to government, and to society, on the relationship of science to religion, which is an unavoidable topic uh, that must be addressed in any such uh, discussion. And finally, the implications for cultural accommodation between peoples and what we most desire, peaceful relations amongst peoples. Now, let me emphasize at the outset my particular expertise lies in a very limited area of chemical and biomedical science. I'm not a social scientist. My opinions on social matters are entirely my own. They may be of interest, possibly provocative, but they carry no more weight than the opinion of any member of this audience. Let me begin then with biomedical science and in particular, the history of biomedical science. It may surprise you to know, even in a university that was founded as a medical institution, that medical science, as it is practiced today, and as all of us understand it, is little older than this institution, only about 100 years old. Physics and chemistry, of course, began long ago, centuries before. But human biology was until recently almost entirely neglected. A human disease until a hundred years ago was attributed to an imbalance of humors. And the main treatments, especially in the West, were bleeding and violent purgatives. Doctors were not even educated men. When medical science began, the president of Harvard at the time, Charles Eliot, was enthusiastic about adding it to the curriculum of the medical school, the most influential member of his faculty, 
a noted surgeon at the time, objected this would be impossible because none of his students could read or write. Today, as I say, scarcely a century later, medical science stands as a triumph of the human intellect and the greatest frontier for intellectual activity of the future. If, as we all know, the 20th century was an age of physics, then many of us believe the 21st century will truly be the age of biology and especially the age of human biology. Now, this is not to diminish the importance of the physical sciences. As you've heard, my own background is in chemical physics. Quite the contrary. But the boundaries between scientific disciplines have remarkably disappeared. We have today a near continuum of science from the atomic level to that of the whole organism. We will one day understand every aspect of human life in chemical and physical terms. And with that understanding will come control. Control over disease, control over behavior, and we expect also control over intolerant and aggressive behavior, even control over aging and the future of humankind. Now the past affords clear guidelines for fulfilling this great promise. If I were to ask any member of this audience what were the major advances in biomedical science over the past century, most would make a similar list you would think of x-rays for diagnosis and for treatment. Uh, you would almost immediately think of antibiotics, which have largely eradicated bacterial disease. I think many of you would uh, suggest genetic engineering, the basis of most new medicines today. Uh, the list would, in most people's minds, include non-invasive imaging, especially magnetic resonance, magnetic resonance imaging for early detection of cancer and other conditions. These very different, important medical advances have one thing in common. They were all discoveries made in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake with no idea of curing disease or even preventing disease. So the lesson from the past hundred years is clear but counterintuitive. It tells us that to solve a difficult problem in medicine, don't study it directly, but rather pursue a curiosity about nature and the solutions of the problems will emerge. To emphasize this point, I'd like to review very briefly and only an outline the history of two of these discoveries in greater detail, x-rays and then antibiotics. X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen, who had a modest beginning. He was the only child of a textile merchant in the Netherlands. At age 18, he was permanently expelled from school for drawing a caricature of a teacher. He was never admitted to another school in the Netherlands or Germany again. Nevertheless, because of his talent and his persistence, he went on to a distinguished academic career. Uh, at one point, he held the chair in physics at the University of Würzburg, where, in 1895, he was investigating the external effects of electricity passed through a cathode ray tube. And he happened to notice, while doing that, uh, a shimmering, a, a, just a trace of light on a fluorescent screen in the back of his laboratory. Um, he soon discovered that same uh, flash of light could be seen on the fluorescent screen, even when the cathode ray tube was completely covered up with black cardboard. And he realized that a new kind of rays must be responsible, emanating from that tube and illuminating the fluorescent screen. 
He called them X-rays. Everyone else called them Röntgen rays. And Uwe Morwitz has told me they're still called Röntgen rays in Germany, although the rest of the world um, adheres to Röntgen's wish, uh, in all modesty, uh, to refer to them as X-rays. Soon after this discovery, Röntgen was interested in what material might block the passage of X-rays, and he held various substances in front of the cathode ray tube. Um, while holding an object in front of the tube, he saw on the fluorescent screen the skeleton of his own hand. Within a year or two, X-rays were in use for medical diagnostics. And in 1901, scarcely six years after his original observation, Röntgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics. Now let me turn briefly to antibiotics. Almost everyone probably knows the famous story of Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin. But what very few people will be aware is of an earlier discovery made by Fleming, which really formed the basis uh, for the eventual recognition of penicillin and its medical use. This occurred when Fleming was a professor of bacteriology at St. Mary's Hospital in London. He was interested in the properties of disease-causing bacteria, and he grew them in dishes. Uh, and one day when he had a cold, a drop fell from his nose into one of the dishes and killed the bacteria. And he realized that there might be natural substances that could have important antibacterial use. Uh, he traced the effect of that drop from his nose to the protein called lysozyme, uh, which unfortunately as a protein was of no therapeutic value at the time. But it did prepare his mind for a, an observation he made six years later in 1928 when going through his dishes of disease-causing bacteria, he saw one that had been contaminated with a mold, and the mold had killed the bacteria. Uh, he again pursued the basis and was unable to isolate the active substance this time. Uh, it proved to be unstable. He named it penicillin, but gave up in its pursuit, uh, abandoned the idea of a medical use, wrote a paper which he published describing his findings which disappeared into the literature and was soon forgotten. Ten years later, at Oxford University, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain were investigating the lysozyme discovered by Fleming in 1922 and they were interested in its action upon what by then was known to be the target the cell wall surrounding the disease-causing bacteria. Florian Chain, like Röntgen, had humble beginnings. Flory was the son of a shoemaker in Australia. Chain was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. Chain was a remarkable genius, a musical as well as a scientific genius with a photographic memory. Now, Flory made his way through the ranks of academe in Britain and rose to be director of the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology, and his first hire at that school was Ernst Chain. It turned out the two didn't get along at all. They both had uh, violent tempers. On one rare occasion when they could see eye to eye, they both agreed uh, that it would be worth pursuing not only lysozyme, from the original source discovered by Fleming from humans, but also other antibacterial agents of natural origin, which they presumed to be other examples of lysozyme. Chain then, with his remarkable recall of literature, uh, could fortunately remember the obscure paper published by Fleming about penicillin. And as I have said, they assumed this was another lysozyme so they took up its study. Chain soon was able to overcome the instability of penicillin, isolate the material. Of course, it proved not to be a lysozyme, but to be a small molecule with great potential benefit for medical use. Chain and Flory went on to demonstrate this point. They showed the uniqueness of penicillin uh, and proved its value for medical use. 
There remained the problem of, obtain of obtaining sufficient quantities. It was produced in very, very tiny amounts by the mold from which, originally, from which it was originally derived. And the problem of obtaining enough uh, to treat uh, human disease eventually required the collaboration of literally dozens of institutions in Britain and in America, which included universities, many government agencies, research foundations, and pharmaceutical companies, which played a crucial role. The result, of course, was what we have today, the virtual eradication of bacterial disease. And for this achievement, Fleming, Florey, and Chain shared the 1945 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Now, these brief accounts that I have given of the history of x-rays and of antibiotics serve, I think, first of all, to reinforce the importance of truly fundamental, of untargeted research. They also illuminate the process of discovery. This work is invariably done by individuals, not by large teams. Uh, it's not a collective effort. It's the product of individual minds free to explore and to follow the path of science wherever it may lead. All such scientific paths lead ultimately to underlying principles, to the fundamental truths of nature. And it is from this knowledge, from a deep understanding, that practical benefit ultimately derives. Discovery is the engine of progress. Discovery and its offspring, technology, are what separate us, are all that separate us from our original primitive condition. Discovery is the hope for advancement, or as I have written in the title, the short title, the hope of progress in the future. Now the value of discovery for medical and also for economic and even for military benefit has not been lost on government or central planners. The problem is uh, that discoveries cannot be planned. By their very nature, discoveries are unanticipated. They arise from untargeted research. They arise by the serendipity, by chance discovery, to which Sheldon Glashow referred in his Bridges contribution. The only way to make discoveries happen is by the support, as I have said, of many talented individuals free to do science, individuals able to engage in the unfettered pursuit of knowledge. Now, this very fundamental, important fact, so well established by the lessons of the past hundred years, has almost as rapidly been forgotten. It is often forgotten by people in government, by people in industry, even by people in uh, academe. People who uh, are anxious for greater and especially for more immediate practical benefits. I can recall the words from uh, before most of the students here were born of an American president, Lyndon Johnson, uh, to the effect of what he called life-saving discoveries locked up in the laboratory. He was a proponent of an urgent translational research. This serious, this well-intentioned sentiment was simply mistaken. Application of existing knowledge is not the limiting factor for progress. Knowledge itself is the limiting factor for progress. There's no better way to illustrate this point than something which every biologist in the audience here knows well. It is often said we know less than 1% of what there is to learn about human biology. Uh, less than one-tenth of 1% would be more accurate. I could easily prove that point to you quantitatively. Most of you know what I mean by that. Now, consider how enormous have been the benefits to human health, and to the world economy from the less than 1% that we know about human biology. 
Imagine how great would be the benefits of knowing the remaining 99.9%. .9%. What more persuasive call to the pursuit of fundamental knowledge about human biology could there possibly be? Another lesson from the past relates to the support of basic research. This has traditionally come, as most of you know, from government rather than from industry, and that is true for a good reason. The timeline of basic research is so long, it takes decades to discover the solutions of basic, of fundamental problems. Only the public, with a long-range interest in bettering the human condition, will support such an undertaking. Industry with a short-term interest in the bottom line really can't be expected to do so. I mean, what CEO, what head of a company could be uh, expected to report uh, to his or her board of directors that they have just made a major investment in research that will take uh, at least 10 or 20 years to perform and may or, in, or it may not be profitable in the end. To emphasize that point, let me give you a concrete example, a very real example, uh, what I think is actually a frightening example. Pharmaceutical companies, and I speak now of the major uh, and uh, most sophisticated pharmaceutical companies, developing anti-cancer drugs are regularly forced to choose between a drug that will cure cancer in a single dose and a drug that must be administered weekly and will prolong life for only a week or two, at most a year. Management always makes the right choice on behalf of shareholders and chooses the less effective drug. Now, this is not an exaggeration. This is not an isolated or a rare occurrence. I am assured by colleagues of mine who are the best oncologists in, uh, in America and among the very best in the world, this happens on a weekly basis in the best pharmaceutical companies in the world. Clearly, government has a special and important, a unique role to play. The return on the investment by government has been enormous. The eradication of polio, the cure of childhood leukemia, and many other diseases have saved far greater amounts of money in terms of treatment and human productivity, not to mention the value in the relief of human suffering. Not only has the investment by government been, be, been, by government been repaid many times over, but it was very, very small to begin with. Basic research is cheap. The annual budget for, basic, for cancer research in the United States is only about $5 billion, which is less than 10% of what we spend on soft drinks annually. It's less than a week of the lamentable, of the unfortunate war in Iraq. Now, you may ask, in a smaller country than the United States, like Thailand, why not wait for the U.S. to support the basic research, let its rich government pay for the acquisition of knowledge, which will immediately be published. It will appear in the scientific literature. It, it, will, it will be available for all to read, to criticize, and of course to exploit for all of the benefits. The answer to this question is the importance, the value of leadership, and ultimately of the retention of your best minds of the preservation of your talent. Those who create new knowledge lead in its application. And I, I, I must give the, cite the example I know best, which is of high tech and biotech, which developed nearby in the San Francisco Bay Area in the Silicon Valley, um, next door to the university I call home, Stanford University. The basic discoveries upon which both high tech and biotech were based, were, um, <clears throat> are based were largely made at Stanford and at the University of California at Berkeley. Others around the world have, of course, uh, benefited. They've joined in the rewards. Uh, but the Silicon Valley has profited uh, to a far greater extent, not only economically, but most importantly, in terms of the people, the people involved the talent that drives the enterprise. 
the very best and brightest um, from all around the world have come to train in our area, uh, at Stanford, for example, and then have remained, or they have even been attracted after training elsewhere. It is of crucial importance for other universities, other institutions, other countries, to compete, to retain their best talent, and to recruit from around the world to their locations as well. A marketplace for talent is in the best interests of all concerned. Now let me emphasize what is of the greatest importance of all, a marketplace for young talent. The uh, employment of young scientists is necessary not only to retain them, uh, to keep them nearby, uh, but to encourage them even to undertake science uh, at all. The choice of a career in science represents a great sacrifice. A passion for science must be weighed against a long period of training, usually 10 years of postgraduate study at low wages, and then the possibility of no employment whatsoever, no career at the end. Now the importance of young scientists really cannot be overstated. Progress in science, as we all know, discovery is particularly the product of young minds, far younger than my own. I'd like to add a disclaimer. Um, the marketplace for talent is not only in the universities, not only academic, but also industrial. And by emphasizing the crucial role of government in the support of science, I don't mean to diminish the role of industry. Um, I've already mentioned the vital contribution made by pharmaceutical companies in the development of penicillin. And this is not a single or a rare example. It's an illustration of a time-honored process. Industry has been, industry will remain responsible for taking discoveries made in academic laboratories and transforming them into commercially viable technologies. The time scale, the time allowed by industry for development may be much less than required for discovery in academic laboratories, but the financial scale is far greater. An academic lab may spend a few hundred thousand dollars to arrive at a discovery. Industry will invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the improvement and testing of a single drug to achieve regulatory approval. Now, I hope I've convinced you that basic science uh, is of the most, of the greatest importance for addressing practical problems. But what relevance does it have to social issues, the pressing social issues of human rights, of international peace, and what have you? I might just mention an obvious point, well known, I'm sure, to almost everyone here. Uh, the practice of science, as it's evolved over the past century, is an example of international cooperation. The majority of the young people who have worked in my laboratory over the, year, over the years come not from the United States. They've come from Europe, from Israel, from all over Asia, from Central and South America. And my laboratory is no exception. The findings made by these people in my lab and others are published in a literature which is available worldwide. I think the real significance of science for addressing social issues um, goes deeper and lies beyond. It's sometimes commented that the knowledge gained by science or that education of young people for the acquisition of that knowledge is an antidote to social problems, to hatred, to intolerance, and to other afflictions of society. That is definitely, I think we would all agree that is the case, but it is not alone sufficient. Education in general, scientific knowledge in particular, is not a complete prescription for social ills. Uh, and I can't help pointing out that the most learned society in the history of mankind, that of uh, 20th century Germany perpetrated the worst offense against humanity in the history of mankind, the Holocaust. 
more than half of those who planned the mass murder of the Jews at the Wannsee Conference in 1941 held doctoral degrees. The product of scholarship, including science, will not alone protect us from atrocious behavior. Rather, I believe the culture of science, the underlying nature of science, may at least serve as a model, a paradigm for addressing social issues. Science, as I have said, <clears throat> seeks fundamental principles and scientific truth is universal. Scientific truths are at least one point that can be agreed by all. And I would suggest that science, as it derives, as it relies upon reason, is analogous to the rule of law which equally derives from an application of reason and whose application depends in particular upon the unbiased, the objective application of reason uh, by uh, an appropriate judiciary. If science, as I say, represents the light of reason, then as Sandra Day O'Connor, a recent uh, justice on the American Supreme Court has noted, Aristotle, so long ago, stated the rule of law is nothing less than the rule of reason, balanced by considerations of equity, so that just results may be obtained. 300 years ago, Alexander Hamilton, who was a soldier in the American Civil War and American War of Independence and was one of those who wrote the American Constitution, said a steady, upright, and impartial, unbiased administration of the laws is essential. <clears throat> because no man can be sure he may not tomorrow be the victim of a spirit of injustice. So science may not solve the world's problems, but the culture of science, the application of reason, balanced by considerations of equity so that just results may be obtained. 300 years ago, Alexander Hamilton, who was a soldier in the American Civil War and American War of Independence and was one of those who wrote the American Constitution, said a steady, upright, and impartial, unbiased administration of the laws is essential because no man can be sure he may not tomorrow be the victim of a spirit of injustice. So science may not solve the world's problems, but the culture of science, the application of reason in society through a rule of law appropriately administered can serve as a model for addressing our social problems. Now, I can't uh, quote Aristotle and Hamilton, without acknowledging the pursuit of truth underlying the human condition, is of course far older than even Aristotle. Both Eastern and Western religion are founded on fundamental principles. For example, the uh, precepts of Buddhism or the Ten Commandments of Judaism. And I'll briefly explain why the pursuit of basic knowledge the practice of basic science is in a very meaningful way a reflection of something very similar uh, to what is embodied in religion. Both science and religion seek to explain the fundamental mysteries of life and of the universe. Uh, of course, the conclusions that are reached are very different, but what I think is remarkable is that since uh, the beginning of time, Men, humans, have sought knowledge in this way, have sought to explain mysteries, have sought to understand life at all. People have spent enormous effort to gain knowledge, to gain such understanding. We as people will take mortal risks and endure great suffering to do so. Take the example of exploration of the earth or of outer space. I think creation of art and literature is another example. The urge to explore, the urge to acquire knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake is something very fundamental. It's a part of our human nature. 
The goal is testing the limits of the possible, of always discovering the knowledge that lies beyond. We possess an inherent desire to know. We possess an inherent urge to understand. It's common, as I say, to science and religion. Um, I've said it's an overarching purpose of basic research. It is truly an expression of the human spirit. Now, there is, if you will, a second reason for the pursuit of knowledge, um, and it is the intrinsic value of intellectual activity. Truth does have a certain purity that I think we all know when we see it. One last comment on these lines. Uh, our effort to understand, our pursuit of knowledge has been encouraged by our success in doing so. Uh, people have remarked uh, that there is no human capability more remarkable than the capability of actually explaining the capacity to do so itself. Really the question is how much will we ultimately succeed in explaining? How far will this capability extend? Already our explanations for the mysteries of the world have gone beyond simple reason uh, and require abstract thinking. Chem cosmology, chemistry, biology can only be understood in terms of genuinely abstract ideas. The behavior of matter at high energy is explained in terms of relativity, hardly a straightforward notion. The nature of matter on an atomic scale, so chemistry, can only be understood properly in terms of quantum mechanics, which is an equally peculiar and obscure description. And finally, evolution of our species can only be understood in terms of a vast extent of time, geologic time, also really beyond our ordinary comprehension. I thought I would illustrate this last point, namely the working, the abstract notion of geologic time with an example from my own research. And here I'll digress very briefly. Uh, I'll illustrate this point uh, with just a few slides. As you have heard from the introduction, my own studies over the years have been concerned with the role of genetic information I think all of you know that genetic information resides in DNA. Um, the substance of our, of our genes is the material called DNA. Probably all of you are also aware DNA plays two roles. It is a repository of genetic information that is copied and transmitted to our offspring. Equally, it serves to direct the formation and the function of our bodies. My concern over the years has been understanding this latter role of DNA, how it serves to direct the form and function of every living organism. Now, work of others before my time showed the way in which the information of DNA is translated into the structure of our bodies <clears throat> occurs in two stages. First, the information in the DNA is copied into a form called the genetic message, and then after that, it is translated into another form, that of protein. The process, the first step of copying, is the same as writing out a text with a pen. We refer to copying a text as transcribing the text, the process by which the information in DNA is copied into a genetic message is also called transcription. The machinery for copying the information from DNA into the genetic message, which has a similar name, RNA, the machinery is, goes by uh, an obscure name, RNA polymerase. My own work investigating this first stage this most crucial first step of the process of expressing genetic information has revealed two principles of the process. To explain the first, bear in mind that we contain, our cells contain a large amount of DNA. 
the information for constructing a human resides in 30,000 genes. They are arrayed in the form of a very long, thin DNA molecule. The DNA of our genes, uh, if stretched out to its full length, would be one meter in extent. It must be compressed into the cells of our bodies in a space only a micrometer. So the first problem I studied in my scientific career along these lines was the means by which this compression is accomplished. <laughs> we already knew what happens. It had been known for a century that it occurs from pictures taken with light microscopes as far back as the turn of the century. Chromosomes containing our DNA could be seen in a highly condensed form moving in two groups towards the opposite poles of a dividing cell where they would constitute the genetic material of the daughters of a cell division. Then, at the completion of the division, the chromosomes unfold. They're no longer visible uh, for the expression of the genetic information contained within them. I discovered many years ago the principle for such coiling of DNA as well as its unfolding. It resides in a particle. You heard mentioned in the, in the introduction, it's called the nucleosome. It is the basic unit of coiling the long slender thread of DNA in the compact form of a chromosome to fit inside a cell. This basic unit of coiling consists of DNA wrapped around a set of histone or individual protein molecules. Uh, and many of these particles are then coiled at higher levels to achieve the compact state. Now, expression of the genetic information requires the release of the DNA. Once released, it is acted upon by the molecule I mentioned, the machinery called RNA polymerase, which assembles a long, thin RNA molecule receiving instructions from the DNA. For the purpose of discovering the structure of the RNA polymerase and thus understanding the mechanism by which genetic information is copied into RNA, we first formed large single crystals of the machinery, the RNA polymerase, shown here. And then we determined their structure with the use of very intense X-ray beams derived from the one mile long linear accelerator at Stanford University. The electrons accelerated down this one mile long path are dumped into a circular storage ring. When electrons circulate around such a ring, they emanate X-rays. And then in the buildings you see here, the x-rays are shown upon those crystals and the structure of RNA polymerase is derived. This machinery is made up of 10 protein components, contains nearly 30,000 atoms, and this was the problem, the solution of the problem that we found in the year 2000. Here you see 30,000 individual atoms that constitute the machinery for reading the genetic information. Now viewed in this way, it's not terribly informative, it's helpful to trace the path of the protein molecule through the structure, and that path is shown here in white. What you see here is not just the machinery alone, but the RNA polymerase machine in the act of reading the genetic message. This is the DNA double helix as it enters from the right. It unfolds, and then a strand of RNA is copied, shown here in red. Now, <clears throat> what we observe here is a, min a minute machine. We have learned it contains many moving parts to execute the process of transcription. We refer to these parts, and indeed they constitute a clamp. Other parts are truly jaws. There is a rudder, there is a lid, there is a trigger. This minute object is a machine of extraordinary intricacy and astonishing capability. 
It can read the genetic information and transcribe it into another form. It's scarcely believable that it could have arisen by a random process of evolution, and yet it did through the workings of geologic time. Now you may think that understanding a fundamental process in this way, demystifying the process of transcription, somehow diminishes the wonder of nature. But on the contrary, we on seeing such a machine are awestruck by its beauty. It's a sense of awe that can evoke a spiritual response. And there's no better way to explain than this quote from Albert Einstein who said, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced there is something that our minds cannot grasp. As I have said, relativity, quantum mechanics, geologic time, something whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly, this is religiousness and in this sense I am a religious man. I think the same sense of awe that we gain from such understand, understanding can finally engender a firm belief in the power of reason that belief. So in all of its aspects, the quest for larger meaning, faith and the passionate pursuit Science truly resembles religion. At the deepest level, both science and religion are, as I have already said, reflections of our basic humanity. Where science does depart from religion is in its foundation upon verifiable truth. That is its greatest appeal, and that is what the culture of science has to offer to society. So with that, let me summarize and conclude. I've told you that basic science is quite literally a bridge to understanding nature and to the practical benefits that derive. But what I've tried also to tell you, basic science is at the same time, in a figurative sense, a bridge to the solution of grave societal problems through the example it sets of a reliance on reason and of an impartial application of reason. Science leads to technological progress. The culture of science may lead, even if indirectly, to progress towards peace and understanding. And with that, I thank you. has been arranged but I'm sure that some of our audience here we have some questions to our very, very special guest today for those young minds young scientists sitting behind the lecture room please stand up and come to the microphone thank you very much for that beautiful lecture and um, I certainly agree with you that the culture of science uh, should lead to less societal conflicts if we all adopt that culture, reason and so on. And I wish the Thai society had more of that culture so we wouldn't have conflicts in the streets or even in the airports. <laughs> But anyway, my, my question to you concerns the last part of your lecture on the genetic message. Uh, of course, we understand that from DNA, you get RNA, that's the genetic message, and then is expressed as proteins. What I wonder is whether proteins themselves can be the genetic message. For example, as we see in the case of prions and so on, they seem to carry the message which can be transmitted to offspring. So 
What is your opinion on, on that aspect of genetic message? Heritable, that is to say that without any other contribution it is transmissible, uh, that it can pass from one generation to the next, um, that it can be replicated or reproduced. Uh, and by that definition, prions are genetic material. Uh, prions are proteins which uh, can reproduce themselves in their active form and which are transmissible without any other, the participation of any other agent. Prions do, however, represent, if you will, the exception that proves the rule. So uh, prions, while their existence is well demonstrated, um, are fortunately for human health comparatively rare. And uh, the principal mechanism for the transmission of information remains, although uh, not exclusively, in the province of the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. So, uh, it is my belief that the teaching of science should be done far more generally. I think uh, it shouldn't be a, an option. I don't think every young person at the university uh, should have a choice between, as often happens, uh, science or social science or another topic. Uh, I think that everyone would benefit from learning science, not the details, not um, all of the facts, but the, the method of science, the beauty of science, uh, and ultimately uh, the principles of science. When I was a young person studying chemistry, I was enormously fortunate. I uh, was not subjected to what probably every student in this audience has experienced, and my children did, uh, when taught the subject of chemistry. Um, I wasn't asked to learn the facts. Uh, I was taught a course in which there was no requirement to memorize anything at all. Uh, I was taught a course in which uh, the entire time was spent performing very simple experiments, very beautiful experiments, that illustrated the principles of chemistry. Nothing more, nothing less. You can easily understand how I fell in love with chemistry and wanted to make a career in the subject, but it went beyond that because it taught me as an impressionable young person about the, the importance and the power of principle. Uh, I think there isn't anyone who wouldn't respond uh, to that kind of experience and be left with an impression that extends far beyond the application to science. Uh, as I've said, uh, once impressed with the power of reason, it's almost unavoidable to apply it in other spheres. And uh, we know that in the social realm, where reason is most needed is an application of the law to ensure a civil society. Uh, and that, I think, as I say, is the hope not only of scientific but of social progress. Guest from Kaseza University. Hi, uh, my name is Chalun Pun Kanchanavalin. I'm a lecturer in biophysics from uh, Kaseza University. Uh, I have a question, but uh, it's not exactly science, but I just wonder about, uh, I just would like to give uh, a question on how important is uh, democracy uh, to science? Is, is it necessary to have democracy for science to to be in progress, or is it not? No, I actually think that's a very good question. And, uh, and, and I, th I think that, on, that it must be acknowledged that on the one hand, uh, great science has been under, been under conditions of uh, political limitation, if not oppression. I mean, there, were, there was great science done uh, in the Soviet Union during a very difficult period in the history of that country. Uh, there is fine science being done elsewhere around the world, but ultimately uh, the greatest success is achieved under conditions of 
a genuine intellectual freedom. And the reason, if you like, is along the lines of what I was uh, discussing. First of all, the science depends on a completely unconstrained pursuit of knowledge wherever it may lead. And conditions that in any way uh, place boundaries on such pursuits will have a chilling effect. Beyond that, and this is perhaps the most important point of all, discovery depends on risk taking. Discoveries are not made, as I have said, by people who make a plan to do so and who can be sure that they will succeed. Discoveries are made by people who take chances, um, who take risks. Now, risk taking is far more likely in an open society where failure is possible than under other circumstances where failure may have adverse effects on the future of the individual. Uh, sir, I'm going to ask a little bit more abs absurd questions. <laughs> uh, this question is actually not my, you know, I have heard it being asked by a young person to Dr. Glashow. I believe it's in Kachanaburi, you know, the question is that, do you believe in God? So let me, no, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. As I told you, any question is fair game and I'll try to give you, can I be heard? And I will give you the most honest answer that I can. Personally, I'm a confirmed atheist. I am a believer only. So I'll repeat, personally I am an atheist, I don't believe in God, I believe only in the application of reason, and I think that, as I have just uh, been at some pains to explain, that's irrelevant, if you'll pardon my saying so, to the point that I wish to make. I think that the way in which I approach science is no different from the way in which a religious person approaches the questions that concern him or her. As I have said, the essential components of science, as I understand it and I practice it, are faith, that is to say, my belief that it will be possible to explain everything in chemical and physical terms, passion, science is an emotional activity, not a dry pursuit. We do science for the joy of it, we do science because we love it, uh, we do science with every ounce of energy we can bring to the subject. Faith, as I said, passion, and uh, ultimately uh, a, uh, an interest in, a, a, an urge to explore, uh, to discover, uh, to acquire new knowledge. In all of those respects, my practice of science is no different from that of a religious person in pursuit of their own way of life. These differences between people are really unimportant if you recognize that in our uh, approach to whatever we do, um, we are fundamentally the same. And uh, I would not for a moment, I, let me say that I have had many, some of my best, some of my brightest students were the most religious people that I've known. Uh, and uh, there was never any conflict between their belief in a God and my belief otherwise. Uh, they remain my closest friends. Uh, so there's no reason why religion needs, or the absence of it, or a disagreement about it, needs to be a cause of conflict in the world. I mean, as we all know, many people have died over history in wars and other conflict related to religion. Quite unnecessary if reason is brought to bear and with it the recognition that we are fundamentally pursuing the same questions in the same way with the same human, absolutely, essentially human uh, approach to the problem.